why wouldn't someone ask for the help of Jesus? That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 8. All right, we are in the midst of Luke. Luke comes into basically three parts. We have the early ministry, then we have the core of his message. That's where we're getting at now. And then will be his final exodus from our life of sin to Jesus going to the cross in Jerusalem. It will be a journey in that third act. But let's talk about today about miracles and some of the amazing miracles and parables that Jesus tells to his disciples and other people while he is still in his ministry. So we start off chapter eight with seeing that he's with the women. He has Joanna, who's the wife of Cusa. That is someone in Herod's household. Now, most leaders at this time, and Herod being the worst of them, were paranoid. They thought everyone was trying to kill them. You're probably right. So getting into the household was a sign of honor. You had to be tight with the family. So she was a position of high standing in the community. This means that the message of Jesus is not just to the lowly, but it's to everybody. But not only that, the message is getting out to all stratas of society. Everybody is starting to hear this and believe. There's Susanna, Mary Magdalene, and we know there are other women too. We've heard other women that follow Jesus, but in this case, these were the ones that were mentioned. He is preaching to the villages throughout the towns, bringing the good news. He wants everybody to hear his message. He's not just sitting in Capernaum or sitting in one spot and having everyone come to him. He is making sure people hear this message. And what's great about it is we've seen throughout Luke, his community started out much larger than we knew with Elizabeth and Zechariah, but also the people who heard about the wondrous messages coming out. And then the people who heard of the blessing of Jesus being born. This is a large community. And I bet you there were people out there who wondered, how did this story turn out? Obviously, gossip is probably a big part of any society. But think about that. 30 years ago, all these miraculous things happened. And they probably kept their eyeballs on them. What's happening with Elizabeth and Zechariah? What's happening with Mary and Joseph? What's happening with their children? Are they miraculous in some kind of way? Now we're getting new people, old people. We're getting all sorts of people to hear his message. And I think we don't appreciate as much how amazing this is that, first of all, women are even mentioned. But for women to be able to hang out with Jesus, to be a part of his ministry, they had zero standing in society. A lot of them couldn't own land. They couldn't handle wealth. Everything went to the oldest son. And so their position was very lowly. And maybe their husbands loved them. Maybe. Maybe their husbands treated them well. Maybe. But for the most part, nothing. Then take a look at these women that we have, you know, following Jesus. A woman who was sick. Sinful women who were filled with demons. We saw early on Anna, who was the prophetess, who knew immediately who Jesus was. Men also believed in Jesus. But it's just earth-shattering for these women to be part of this group. It takes away from that idea that the Gospels are propaganda pieces, because if you wanted these to be propaganda pieces to show the message of Jesus or to show how great the apostles were, you certainly wouldn't be mentioning women and mentioning some other people in here. So this is really astonishing and shows us we are all part of God's ministry. We are all part of God's community. And Jesus loves us all the same. Paul will say it later. We'll talk about it someday. But we know that God is for all of us. We start off by telling the parable of the sower. Now, this is a much more abbreviated version than we've seen in Matthew. This is where we throw out some seeds and some of it landed on rocky land and some of it on thorny bushes. The thorny bushes are where temptation and dangers lie. Rocky areas can't grow anything. Keep in mind that in this particular case, it was changed a little bit. Again, each of the authors, this is God-breathed, comes from the Holy Spirit. God helps them and tells them what to write about. I kind of did some quick math. If Jesus' ministry lasted for three and a half years, that's 1,277 days-ish, right? There were many days 
that were just never written about, that we never heard about, that we never saw, that every message or every telling of every different story is going to be exactly like. For some people, it's going to be that depth. Again, Jesus seems to know what everyone is thinking and know the exact thing that should be said. And so he will know when people need to hear all the message, every bip and bop of what he had to say. And sometimes they just need the gist of it. And being an agricultural society, I think everyone would love this particular parable. It makes sense. And at the end, there's a little bit of a difference where it said, and some seed fell in good soil and yielded a hundredfold. It was bountiful. It produced more. I was listening to Rick Warren's podcast this morning, which is his sermons. And he said, you know, you reap what you sow, but it's not exactly true. You reap much more than you sow, right? So I'm going to plant an apple seed. Now I have an apple tree and I get a hundred apples. And each of those apples will have, I don't know, a dozen seeds. Every single plant gives you more. So from one seed, I'm now getting hundreds of seeds. If we do it right, we will always get more than what we planted. And in this case, a hundredfold, he says. Now, I'm the world's worst gardener in the world. Ask anybody. I mean, technically, I'm a master gardener, so I know what I'm doing, but I'm awful at it. And the other thing to know about seeds is that seeds take time. That when you plant something, it takes a long time to bear. I think about all the people in my life who told me about Jesus. Some of them told me in some very bad ways, and some people told me in some very good ways. But they planted seeds. And it took decades for those seeds to come out. So don't feel, too, that immediate success will happen. Seeds take a while. And then if the person doesn't reject it, either because what's going on in their life, they throw it out, they don't give it the soil it needs to grow. I'm finding some really, just as a side note, some really interesting commentaries from Daryl Bach and his commentary on Luke. Really good, fresh perspective on all of this. I'm, I'm enjoying this particular book. I don't know if you wrote other commentaries, but this one's really good. We move on then to the purpose, the reason behind the parables. And again, we've seen this in other, in other gospels, but he's like, why, why are you doing this? Why do you talk about the parables? What does this even mean? And he says that this is, you know, so that you'll know the secrets of the kingdom. You'll know how it is that things are supposed to go. And he says other people are not going to get it. They're not going to understand it. They're not going to see it. And that's because he keeps telling people, you know, if you have eyes, see, if you have a mind, you know, understand it, if you have ears, hear. But there are people who are just either going to try not to understand it, try very hard to ignore what it says. I'm not a rocky soil. I don't know what he's talking about. Or just dismiss it. So for some people, they're going to walk away from this and go, oh, yeah, I know what he means. You know, I'm a farmer. I get that. Sometimes seeds just don't take. When you have the right place for the seed to go, it will grow an amazing tree or an amazing plant, bear fruit. So some people are just not going to get it. And I think, you know, when you see the whole attitudes, we've gone through, this is our third gospel. Every single time you will see people waiting traps for Jesus, waiting for him to say the thing, do the thing, because they're not letting the seed take place. They are using that seed and trying to attach Jesus with it. I know it's kind of weird to attack someone with a seed, but you know what I mean. And so that's part of it. And so understanding these messages, digging deep, looking at it, and even asking the question, you know, who are we? Are we good soil? Are we trying to accept the word of God? Are we allowing the thorn bushes in our lives to creep in on us? Our secret sins, our things that we don't want anyone to know, are they coming in and are we letting them in? Boy, good questions, I think. And then he talks again about lighting a lamp and covering it, putting it under a bed, right? You don't do that. Again, one of my favorite parables. I love all the light parables. I think because I grew up in an area where total darkness existed. There were many times as a kid, I was in total darkness and it's creepy, but you understand the importance of any bit of light you can take to make existing in that darkness better. And that's what he's saying here. You would never do this. You would never hide it. It was expensive and valuable to people. And Jesus is the light of the world. And he says, that's what's going to happen. 
everything's going to be known. Everything is going to come to light. What's interesting about the parable is it takes more effort to hide light than to just let it shine. And he warns us to be careful about listening to what you hear. And what you have, you're going to get more of it because you have listened to the message. You have learned the secrets. But the one who hasn't, they're not even going to have what they have right now. The whole point of speaking in parables is it's not a trap, but it's a trap to those who are trying to make this a trap. They are going to not understand this. They're going to try not to understand it. Again, I, my whole life is filled with people saying this and that about the Bible, this and that about this story, this about how Jesus said this or did this thing, because they don't want this to be a good message. They hear what they want to hear, that Jesus is a horrible person, shouldn't be followed, even if he was God. When you actually listen to him, pay attention, that's when you're going to soak it in like the water that goes on those seeds to extend the parable. But that's what he's doing. For those people who allow that to soak in, their seeds are going to grow and they will get hundredfold. And to those who don't, they're going to have what they have now taken away. Jesus' mother and brothers come. If you are in Protestant denominations, we believe these are his actual brothers because they were concerned for him. They wanted to check on him to make sure he was okay. The gist of it from other places is that they thought they should seize him, that maybe he has gone too far or that he is endangering himself. If you are Catholic, you believe that these brothers is translated more as brethren. So these would not be brother brothers, but in fact, people who are his brothers in spirit, so to speak. But they came and this is where Jesus says, my mother and my brother are those who hear the word of God and do it. That's ESV. And we've heard that in other gospels too. Then they got into the boat. They're crossing the sea. We heard this one in Matthew. And they're going to the other side. And Jesus falls asleep in the boat. And my opinion of that was when we were in Matthew, only a man who knows the truth of God and the protection of God could sleep in a raging storm on the water in a little boat and when you can sleep like that in a storm you know you have the faith going for you but then they woke him up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves it says and there was calm and he asked him where is your faith you were afraid you know and they it says marveled at each other who can command the wind and the water this is obviously like a big impressive miracle these first apostles in general, because they live along this lake that is perpetually having storms, it is a very stormy lake because of its shallowness, they know how these storms go. They just don't stop because someone rebukes them. Someone points out that the end of this particular passage ends with a question, who can do this? And you know what? Luke doesn't give the answer directly, but he guesses that you're going to figure out who can do that. Jesus then heals that man who is living in the caves, who's like chained up and living in tombs. We've talked about him in the other Gospels. Real scary moment. This is real horror movie stuff. And when he sees Jesus, this man, he cries out, falls down. And then with a loud voice, the demons inside of him are like, what do you have to do with me? Don't torment me. You know, he's rebuking Jesus. Don't, don't even come here. And he commanded the unclean spirits to come out of the man. And the demon said, or the demons, we find out it's a legion, which is 6,000. Don't torment me. The man, like I said, was sitting in tombs. He was chained up. He had guards upon him. He was able to break out of his chains. He was frightening everybody. And so he starts talking to Jesus, like, what do you do with me? Go away. Don't, you know, torment me. I wonder if the demons had asked for forgiveness. Would that have changed the whole thing? I wonder what happened. Can demons ask for forgiveness? I mean, it probably means by being demons, you're so far gone, you can't anymore. So Jesus says, hey, you know, what's your name? And the guy says, Legion, which again is 6,000 men in a legion, like a group. He says, well, you know, don't send me back. Don't send me away. 
or end me, put me in that large herd of pigs on the countryside. So Jesus allowed this. The demons came out and entered the pigs, and then all the pigs, 2,000 we find out in Mark, uh, ran into the lake, which is, like I said, if it's 6,000 legion and 2,000 pigs, that's like three. And why? Why did the pigs run into the lake? Because demons only destroy things. It's all they can do. And someone else in one of the commentaries suggested this would also put animosity between the village and Jesus because they wanted those pigs. They liked those pigs. Those pigs were going to be for dinner. When the man recovered, he asked Jesus, can I follow you? Can I come with you? And he says, nope, you got to go home and tell everyone what God has done for you. He's going to be a witness to this town. People see this man that everyone was scared of to the point where they chained him up and he was cutting himself. I think they're going to see what a miracle this is. Then Jesus returns to the area and there's the crowd. The crowd is always waiting for him. They always want to hear from him. And a man named Jairus, who it says was a ruler of the synagogue, falls at Jesus' feet and asks him to come to his house. His daughter was sick, 12 years old, was dying. And so everyone's pressing in around him. Can't you just see and feel all this? The more popular Jesus gets, the more squished in he gets, the more people want to see him, want to be a part of him, want to be healed by him. I mean, who wouldn't? Of course we would. So as people were pressing in, one of the women who was ill, and it says that she had a blood disorder that was for 12 years, so the exact same age as Jairus' daughter, she had it for a long time. And because of the crowd, maybe because she was unclean and lowly, she was probably having to live out in the wild because no one's going to let an unclean woman like that live in town. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. Now, the fringes are part of the religious beliefs. It's part of the religious dress of Jews at this time. But she reaches out and it's like, feels to me like the only thing she can touch is because he's walking. And he says, hey, I perceived power went out of me. Who touched me? And then the woman suddenly is in the front and center of all of this. And so she must be scared. She's going to be tossed out of town. She's going to be called unclean. And he says, quote, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. He heals her. He intends to heal her. And like I said, when Jesus is all knowing, his schedule book looks full of things that look like surprises to us not surprise it to him. Okay, so I'm going to walk towards Jairus' house. The crowd's going to come in on me. She's going to touch my cloak. I'm going to heal her. Check. Now we're going to go to Jairus' house. We see this day unfolding, and Jesus is willing because people are trying desperately to reach him. They are a part of the miracle he's providing to their lives. And so while he was still speaking, the ruler of the house said it came and said, hey, Jairus, your daughter's dead. Leave Jesus alone. It's over with. It's too late. Peter and John and James are with him. And then the mother of the child, they come to the house. They all still keep going and everyone's crying and weeping. And Jesus says, don't weep. You know, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And then they laugh at him. Obviously, we know when someone is dead, don't be an idiot. You know, they're just, it's mocking. You know, we'll see all those times where people don't believe God, right? Abraham, didn't believe that he was going to be the father of a great nation. We saw Zechariah lose his speech because he didn't believe it. And so here we go, another thing. And he says, child, arise. And her spirit returned and she got up and that she should be given something to eat. And everyone was amazed. And Jesus says, don't tell anyone. So when we're near Jerusalem, we're not going to talk about this because we don't need the message going to Jerusalem that soon. So we've seen in all of this that Jesus has power over illness. Jesus has power over demons. Jesus has power over the wind and waves. And now Jesus has power over life itself. What can't this man do? And that ends chapter eight. My meditation this week is going to be just about that. That kind of faith that the woman had where she would just know that if I could just have one little tiny touch of Jesus' cloak, I could be healed. That desperation for a miracle from God, I, that struck me, this reading. What I'm going to pray for is that people know 
that Jesus wants us involved in his miracles, whether it's against demons or illness or death itself. He wants us involved in this, and he wants us to be a part of his miracles. God always involves people in his miracles. And what I'm going to pray about is that I have that kind of faith that will reach out to God. Why don't people try to get miracles from God? Either they don't understand, or they're rocky soil and the seed is not growing, or they're allowing themselves to be turned aside by all these different things. God just wants us to ask him to reach out to him, and he is willing to heal us in the way we need to be healed. And of course, it can't mean that we're not going to face illnesses in this life. One way or the other, this life or the next, healing comes. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com or I'm on Twitter. You are always welcome to send me a DM on Twitter. Just make sure that if you do get a lot of spam, both about podcasting and about other things, please say you've listened to a podcast, you know, which podcast you listen to. So I understand what it is you're trying to say and that you're just not spam. Thanks so much.